I had a youth group girl. She had come from a background of not going to church, not hearing about Jesus, and she came to youth group for several years with her friends. Her friends became in the band and leaders. She was reading the Bible. She wanted to know lots of things. And um, then they kind of took a nosedive because they all secretly started partying and doing drugs. And then the parents found out and I found out. And I came to her and I said, oh, what's going on? And you know what she said? But I thought you said that Jesus forgives us for everything. So why wouldn't we go and party and do drugs? Well, clearly she misunderstood this idea of freedom. And our, our reading this morning here is from Galatians, a letter to Galatia. It's about freedom. It was written for the purpose of helping people stay in their freedom. Here you're seeing a little uh, video clip of Nelson Mandela. And if you know any of the history of South Africa and many African nations, you know that often there's this tremendous battle involving many lives where people lose their lives to win freedom and beat the oppressor. But the sad course of history is that in present-day South Africa, and actually more so in, pre in, in the case of Kenya and several other countries that have fought so hard to win their liberty, they get another dictator right afterwards that they elect who makes things every who it makes it much, much worse. Communism is a great example of that. All these people fighting for something better only to make something much worse, only for their freedom to be taken away in yet another way. And this letter is about, they, st they started so well, they started so well in freedom, and Paul says, Okay, you started well. Don't stand fast in that. Don't fall into a new dictator. Don't fall into a new master. Don't put on new handcuffs here. Don't become a slave again. You fought so hard for this. Don't be a regime that changes only to take another dictator. And there was two ways that they were doing this. It wasn't just in the typical way that we've heard from this girl. The other way, and the main way, that the Galatians were getting taken as slaves was back to the law. There were people among them who were saying, well, now that you're a Christian, now that you've come to our Jewish synagogue and become a Jesus follower, you've got to become circumcised, follow all these ceremonial rules. Everything applies to you. And they were making people under bondage to the whole law, attempting through their moral goodness to come to God. Through all of their good deeds, that's how they were going to come to God. And Paul is very clear, that doesn't work. You can't do that. I'm going to go to the definition of freedom, and I've actually pulled up the, this is called the lexicon, that's what we call the dictionary that we use to define the words that are in the Greek, in the Bible, and the very definition, I'm not expecting you to be able to read that, I'm going to tell you, but I wanted to show you, I'm not making this up, the very definition for freedom, that the dictionary for Greek in the Bible, the lexicon, it gets its meaning from our passage today, from Galatians. That's where it derives the meaning of the eulatheria here. It says, liberty or freedom to do or to omit things having no relationship to salvation. And then it, it opposes that to fancied freedom or imagined liberty, which is the license, the, the liberty or the freedom to do as one pleases. True liberty, it says, is living as we should, not as we please. And this is immensely important that we know what freedom is. I know that I have uh, in the past been in a different definition of freedom where, let's, let's take this example. When we were on vacation with my wife when I was younger, we used to have this little saying, and it was when you're on vacation, you should be able to do what you want, when you want. That's kind of how we picture freedom in our country, isn't it? Being able to do what you want is freedom. But you can only do what you want when there's not somebody else stopping you from doing it. And really, when we look at the root word for this definition, um, it comes from the absence of being a slave, the absence of having an oppressor prevent you from what you want to do. Being able to define freedom is everything. If we think freedom is doing what you want, we're going to end up back in those handcuffs because many of our wants, many of our desires put us in those handcuffs. They become addictions. They become habits that take away our freedom. And what 
what we're hearing from Paul is use your freedom, use this newfound regime change to live as you were called. So how are we called? This girl had a point. This girl in my youth group had a point. And the point is really blatant in Ephesians 2. There's no getting around it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. She understood that part very clearly, that Jesus had bought her salvation. There was nothing she could do to buy it herself. And sometimes we think, well, yes, but... And we try and put a little caveat in there, a little bit of a, a clause that says, yes, but you, you still got to, you still got to. We forget that Jesus' gift to us was bought and we can't earn it. She understood that part great, but she totally misunderstood freedom. And it's important that we start here, understanding the gift was bought and there's no way we can pay for it. That's a little shameful for us, isn't it? We don't want to have this thing bought for us. We don't want to even admit that we need it. We, we, it, it puts a little shame on us to think, oh, well, we need this gift in the first place. What if we can just earn it a little bit? What if I can put a little bit of moral goodness in the bank account? Then I'll feel better about myself. This is what the Galatians were doing. They, they started well, but then they wanted to put a little bit of bank account of, well, yes, I'm a good person, though. Look at all these good deeds I do. That's how I'm getting to God because it makes us feel better. It feels good to feel like our moral things will bring us to God, but they don't. So she understood that first part well. The Galatians didn't. The Galatians were trying to go to the law to save themselves. They were trying to go back to the thing that condemned them, to the judge that condemned them, the law, as a way to be saved. And Paul said, if you do that, the full weight of the law will fall on you and you will not make it. You are under the whole law, he said. The whole law of God, if you try to follow the law to save yourself, you'll never do it. Nobody is good enough to use the law to come to God. On the other hand, this girl, like I said, was just partying and, and imagining that this was going to be a great life where she had Jesus' forgiveness on the one hand and her partying with her friends on the other. Let's go to the, to the verse here also from Paul that says, all things are lawful for me. It's true. It's true that you can be forgiven of anything the worst dictator in the world, and, and responsible for those regimes that needed to be changed. The worst people. We know them from jail. We know their past. We know the worst things they have done. The Gestapo behind the Nazis. All of those people can be forgiven if they ask. His grace is so big. We sung it about it this morning. It's so big. Anything can be forgiven. And we read from Paul that all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but I will not be mastered by anything. He doesn't want to put on the handcuffs again. Even though we're allowed, why would we use that freedom to go back and put those handcuffs on? The best analogy I ever heard from this came from a doctor, Paul Brandt. Paul Brandt, um, he wrote devotions. He was just m amazed at the body. He would see your skin and your muscles, your eyes, and he was excited about it as a doctor because he understood some of the things we don't that make this a miracle, this body that we're in. He was so excited, he wrote these devotions, and um, a, a journalist by the name of Philip Yancey put this into a book called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. I read when I was in high school. Dramatically changed my point of view on, uh, when I read this chapter on the bone structure. He said the bones have to be rigid, but they have to move only in certain ways. If you didn't have bones in your body, you couldn't move at all. You'd be a big blob of muscles. Nothing would get done. The bones, though they are rigid, though they only move in certain ways, allow for movement. And he drew this parallel to the law system God had made, to the physics of the moral universe, if you want to put it that way. And he said, because the laws are there, they allow for movement. Now, if we imagine we're going to break a bone to get more movement, you don't get more movement, you get less. Yeah, you're going to, make, you're going to take laws away to get more freedom? Doesn't work. You have less freedom. Or let's say we're going to add some laws. We're going to say that everybody has to be circumcised. Everybody has to do all this ceremony. That's a bit like putting casts on, isn't it? More casts do not allow more movement. They take it away. 
And what we see here is that we have a perfectly designed bone structure for the movement. And what is that movement that God is asking us to? We see it right here in Galatians. He's calling us to bear fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'll explain in a minute why he uses the word fruit, but that is the movement God has called us to. That is what he wants it to look like. The beautiful bones working the way that we were made to work, to be healthy, to show this delicious fruit to other people, to show our love. That is what we are given the freedom for. You, you, you fight to overcome an evil dictator to, to bring a just regime in. You want it to be good. You don't want another evil dictator. You want it to be good. And that's what was intended for us the whole time, what he's bought this freedom for. The key to not falling on the one hand back to the law, like the Galatians did, or on the other hand, like this girl that I'm describing from youth group, into using your freedom for liberty. The key to that, um, it, using your freedom for an opportunity for sin, the key to not doing these two things. It's like there's a road with two ditches, where on the one hand, you want to go back to the law. On the other, you want to try and use it for every sin in the book to try and enjoy life. The key is an old word, and that word is mortification. I don't know how you feel when you hear that word. Maybe you think of Catholic people or, you know, flogging themselves. Maybe it brings all kinds of imagery or feeling to you. It's a kind of ugly word, isn't it? But that's exactly where our text takes us to. He says, you're going to use your freedom for good, for this fruit, and you're going to take those desires that you have that you know are just handcuffs. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have put to death. They've they've crucified with Jesus their human nature with all its passions and desires. They've brought it to the cross. Now, in our culture, in Canada, when you talk about mortification, when you talk about killing your desires, this is usually what comes to mind. This man here, Sigmund Freud, probably has influenced our culture more so than the Bible at this point at least the secular culture outside of our church. And he said, unexpressed emotions will never die. They are buried alive and will come forth later in uglier ways. So he'll say, you are desiring something. You're you're having some kind of a temptation or you're feeling something, this this emotion. You bury that in the ground, it's going to come out somewhere else. It's a little bit like me and my brother when we got my dad's firecrackers from Mexico. He'd bring them. We would wrap them up in tape wrap them up in wire, and then we'd stick the whole caboodle into a medicine bottle. And if you thought the firecracker made a big bang on its own, you wrap it up in all kinds of tape, you put a big shell around it, you've got a bomb. The more that you press press in and contain, the more, the bigger the explosion later. He says in uglier ways. You try and press all those desires down with repression, they'll only come up. Now that leads our modern society to make a conclusion that if you desire something, You are a slave to it. You'll have to do it. There's no way that you could be attracted to somebody or that you could have some kind of feeling and not do it. So just act on it, and we'll find a way to make it free for you to do that. That's our society's approach to this. There's no way to act against your desires, so we'll just find a way for you to act out your desires in a nice, healthy way. And then there'll be no repression, and everybody's all healthy. Well, that is exactly against what the Bible is saying. But the Bible is not advocating repression. The Bible is not saying make a big firecracker. Um, my theology teacher, I can remember him saying, one of, him, one of my theology teachers saying, he went to a dock once, and the dock had a little sign, and it said, no fishing on the dock. And immediately he's like, oh, the fishing must be really good here. And he grabbed his rod, and he was there. That's what the rules and the law do to us. That's what Galatians says will happen. The first four chapters are talking about how the law is only going to be a tutor to make you want to sin more. If you just get more rules, you're just going to get more tempted. It's like burying all those things in the ground. The law cannot eliminate your desires. The law will make them bigger. It'll say, oh, I have a new idea. I never thought to do that bad thing till I read that there was a law against it. Now I really want to break that law. So the law is not our solution. What pops that bubble? The freedom, the freedom that we have been bought, that all things are lawful for me, that you are completely free to choose, 
You're not under any slave. You're not under a slave to your desire, not under a slave to anything. The freedom pops the bubble of progression, and it says you have been bought with a price you could never pay. You are free now to live. And if you really wanted to, you could go back and do it again. And if you came and asked for forgiveness, you would be forgiven again. And I know everybody in here is like, wait, 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 wait. That doesn't sound right at all. If you went and did it again, you'd get forgiven. But it's true. All of us have sinned more than once and asked for forgiveness more than once. And some of you are thinking, well, then people could fool God. Because they could just ask for forgiveness and they could live in all these sinful ways. And they would fool God, wouldn't they? No, they don't. Nobody can fool God. That's, that's silly to think that way. If we think we're going to fool God, we only fool ourselves. If we put ourselves slaves back to the very sin that we've been bought free from, then we're slaves to the destruction of that sin. And nobody wins. Nobody fools God by, by using their grace as an opportunity, as it says in the text, to bite and devour one another. How does this look? How does, how does it practically look for us to act out on this? Let's say you're at the point of temptation, and here's how it sounds for me. Oh, I, I know I shouldn't, but I want to. Do you ever say that? I know I shouldn't, but I want to. Maybe you've said that to yourself, just like I have, or maybe you have your own little say, way that you say it, but at that point of temptation, when you're thinking, oh, I know I shouldn't, but I want to, there's something that you can do, which is this fancy, old-fashioned word, but it's very practical, even today. As for you, my friends, you were called to be free, but do not let this freedom become an excuse for letting your physical desires control you. Instead, let love make you serve one another, for the whole law is summed up in one commandment, love your neighbor. You can use at that moment, at that moment of temptation, you can use the scripture to show you what you're about to do. Are you about to put on some handcuffs again? Are you like the heroin addict after being clean for years who says, oh, but I want to? Realizing full on that there's slavery down that road, that there's death down that road, you can use the scripture to show you what you're about to do in that moment of temptation. And then, rather than thinking that you're going to fight this on your own, that this is your battle against temptation, no, we take it to the cross. We redefine this freedom. This freedom is not to do what we want. It's to do what we are made to do to be free from the slavery so that we could act in the fruit as we should. We take that desire to the cross, we let it be crucified with Christ, and we find at the cross what we were looking for in the first place. See, at the cross, we meet Jesus. Why were we being bad in the first place? Why were we tempted in the first place? What were we doing that took us there? Often, there's a hole here, a hole here, a desire that we wanted to fill with something that couldn't fill it. And we said, I want to, I want to. You had a moment of temptation, a desire there. And who can fill that? Who can fill that hole that the sin can't? Jesus can. He built us. He's how we were made. He's the one who knows that our deepest needs are for relationship and to be loved. And he says, come to me at the cross. I'll meet you. I'll forgive you. And I'll fill that need that you're looking to fill. So at that moment of, I know I want to, but... We can use the scripture to show us the path ahead, that we don't need to go back to a dictator of slavery, but we need instead to come to Jesus, who's going to give us something else. And when we do, our righteousness will surpass that of the Pharisees, Jesus says. It's going to be better, because it's not going to be an external kind of good works. It's going to be on the inside with love. He wants to replace our selfishness, those destructive things with love from the inside. And it's going to look even better than these moral mongers who did nothing but keep the law. It's going to surpass that. It's going to be fulfilled in the law. It's not going to take us down the roots that we saw here of all of this jealous, angry, ambitious evil that will only lead us to not possess the kingdom of God. It's going to take us a new route We will see people who will grow, their love will grow cold, it says in Matthew 24. The love of many shall wax cold. And that's because they'll ignore the moral compass in their heart. They'll run away from what they know is right. They'll increase this lawlessness, as we read. 
and their heart will grow cold. They can never know God when their hearts have grown cold and they've shut them down. They will tune out God. We don't want that for us. We want to help our friends. We want to know ourselves that God has bought us and he wants our hearts to come alive. He wants to turn those desires to the places that they were made to come and to abide in fruit. So why is it called fruit? Why did Paul and Jesus use this word fruit? Because we don't make it. We don't manufacture it like some kind of plastic fruit on us that if we just try hard enough, and this is where I can fall into this, this ditch, I can think, oh, I'm just going to work harder. I'm going to be better. I'm going to do more. That isn't what produces the fruit, is it? What produces fruit is our connection. When we're connected to Jesus, he said, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. When our roots are in deep, when we're connected to the branch, when we are receiving the love of God, he wants to show that love to other people. In that moment of decision, when you're thinking, I know I sh- shouldn't, but I want to, we have a choice there. And that choice is for love. Because all of the sinful choices we could have made, whether we see it or not, we might think of it as a victimless crime. Does anybody ever feel like, oh, this little thing I do is just a victimless crime? But it never is because sin is always a relationship breaker. No matter what it is, no matter how small it seems, it's always a relationship breaker. So we're going to choose instead to be a relationship former, a maker, that's going to, out of love, connect to God and then have love in fruit that shows to other people. If we think about castes and how this might apply to our modern culture today, we want to legislate freedom, don't we? And I believe in freedom, I do. But when you try and legislate it, when you say, you must have freedom for this thing, and you must have freedom for that right, and you must have this and this and this and this, suddenly you've got a whole bunch of competing freedoms. And how do I know if my freedom is going to hurt Andrew's freedom, is going to hurt Charlotte's freedom, they're all in competition. It's so much like a whole bunch of casts so that you're in this whole body cast and you can't move from all the laws you're trying to create. That doesn't actually produce freedom to try and legislate it. Instead, we need to find it by connecting to Jesus in love at the cross. We need to eliminate the sin. We need to eliminate the sin choice that enslaves us, which is the root of our problem in the first place. And that's when we find a road ahead that has glorious movement. Movement that Jesus created for us to show fruit. A bone structure so miraculous of law and physics that it was designed for us to be able to move. We don't go back to the law, as I'm tempted to do to save us. We don't go back to trying to work harder and harder and harder at all the nitpicky little rules. Nor do we use our freedom so that we can just do whatever we want, thinking that's freedom. Instead, we let the the scripture, Galatians, open our eyes to see that true freedom is doing what we are made to do. In Jesus, he has given us fruit through him. He's connecting us so that we can bear fruit to love other people.